My name is Marty, and I get to be on staff here at Mountain View Church. And uh, I want to read to you Psalms 136. I think there's a little reverb. You guys get a little reverb, or is it just my deep, bassy voice? I think I have a little bit of both. I want, to, I want to read to you Psalm 136. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens? His love endures forever. Who spread out upon the waters? His love endures forever. Who made the great lights? His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. To whom who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love. We have the microphone. Is it working now? All right. Well, we got a backup just in case. So we're about halfway there, you guys. And usually this is a call and response. And so we're going to finish with, when I say the line, you're going to say, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who had divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it, but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness, love endures forever. To him who struck down the great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. Sihon, king of Amorites, his love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever and gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. And he remember us in our lowest state. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. And he gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. You know, sometimes we can get we can get callous with those kind of verses, or maybe a better way to say it is we can actually get accustomed to it. Yeah, like we know that his love endures forever, but, and the thing that I love about Psalms 136 is we need to crawl through it. We actually need to, to linger in it, just to take time to let it soak in and do its work. Some of those verses, like he remembered us in our lowest state. He freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature, not just humans. He gives food to every creature across the world. And so it's just good to, to linger in it and not just kind of go past it really quick. It actually reminds me of uh, my wife and I. We, uh, we love the outdoors, and I picked up a couple of kayaks a couple of years ago that were got a really great price on them. But we have kids, and we have grandkids, and so two kayaks isn't enough. And, and so we decided to get a third. And a friend of ours, a close friend of ours, told us that uh, they had one for free. What better prices than a free kayak? And so we went down and we would go pick it up. And she's like, yeah, it's been outside for a really long time. It's covered in leaves, but we'll hose it off when you get here. And so we went, I went down, picked it up. And when I got there, it was like not only covered the leaves that were holding it, it was like black mold on the whole, the whole side of it. Not like the gross, hairy kind, but it's still black mold. So it's, it's just not good. And, uh, and so I'm like, okay, I'm committed now. I couldn't say no. So I threw it on the top of the truck and drove it home. And I tried scrubbing it with some soap and water and it just didn't work. And so I remembered my wife actually had some bleach spray underneath the sink. And so I went inside and grabbed it and sprayed it and wiped it off. And like, yeah, it didn't look any better at all. And so <laughs> I'm like, okay, maybe I need to scrub a little bit more. So I a little bit more. And at that moment, my, my youngest daughter, um, she called me, she's like, hey, dad, can you help me with something? I, I can't remember what it was, but I went inside and I came back out about five minutes later. And, the, and what I didn't share is this kayak is like bright green on one side and black mold on the other side. When I came back out, there was this, circle that was like bright green. I didn't have to touch it. I didn't have to do anything. 
I just sprayed the bleach and it soaked in and I just, I was, I was trying to rub it off too soon. I was trying to fly past it too soon, but, but actually when I let it soak in, it actually restored it almost back to brand new. I mean, I was super excited. I spent like the next two hours out there finishing it up, but it just got me to think is that we need to pause and we need to linger sometimes. Sometimes we put a, a period on things that actually need to have a comma. And gratitude's kind of like that. We need to soak in the goodness of it. And actually, moreover, we need to soak in the goodness of the one who created gratitude. And so today's title of sermon, the, the title of today's sermon is The Power of Gratitude. It changes lives and the world. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time unpacking what gratitude is, how critical it is to our own health, all of our own health, what Jesus is calling us to, and how gratitude can actually change the world. And so my hope today is that you can see Scripture in a, in a really a fresh new way and, and, and remember some of the fresh and simple rhythms of Jesus. And so I want to spend a little bit of time just going over just some of the basics. I apologize, this isn't meant to be a classroom. It's just some of the basics of what gratitude is. So we actually have a slide of what gratitude is. Gratitude is the quality of being thankful, the readiness to show appreciation for and return kindness. And I love that because it's actually twofold. It's not just for myself, but it's also for us to be able to return kindness. And in, our, in our new language nowadays, we can actually say it's, it's a way for us to, to pay it forward. Now, why is gratitude important? Check out these stats. These are, these are some good reasons as to why gratitude is important. Gratitude has been found to be beneficially associated with social, emotional, and psychological well-being. So we need to linger on that. We can actually improve our social, emotional, and psychological well-being simply by being grateful. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity, and build strong relationships. Studies have shown that feeling thankful can improve sleep, mood, and immunity. We have like a spiritual vaccination right there simply by being grateful. Gratitude can decrease depression, anxiety, and difficulties with pains and the risk of disease. I mean, those are some pretty good reasons to be grateful. There's this uh, neuroscientist, I can't remember exact title, Caroline Leaf. Dr. Caroline Leaf is a cognitive neuroscientist, and she states that because of neuroplasticity in our brains, we can change the shape of our brain through gratitude. Because we have agency and the ability to choose, we have the power to sh change the shape of our own brain. It actually reminds me of like, what the Lord talks about and like, the importance of, of actually capturing our thoughts. So those are some really, really good reasons in my mind to be grateful. We could actually probably pause the sermon right now, like drop the mic and, and let's get back to worship again. But I'm actually going to give you some, some more scriptures to support why we should be grateful because that's, that's actually part of the reason why we're here. Being grateful is virtually a command for Christians. As I mentioned in the psalmist, like the psalmist starts off by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His kindness is everlasting. We read the, ver we read the, the version that said his love lasts forever. So everlasting, forever, whichever one you choose, that's actually a really long time. Or in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Paul says, to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for it is good. It is a goodwill for you in Christ Jesus. So let me unpack that one. He starts off by saying rejoice, kind of like in Philippians 4 when he says rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. There's just such a posture that, that we need to be in for being grateful. Not just like a, like a rejoice box, but really this posture. And then we, we always want to look to Jesus because the Bible's supposed to point to Jesus, not the other way around. So scripture points to Jesus, and there's two examples. I know there's more, but there's actually two examples of Jesus being grateful. I remember when he, he took the boys' lunch, you know, and had bread and fish, and he, and he gave thanks to the Lord, and then he fed 5,000 people, and he had leftovers. And some of you may be thinking, oh, it's easy to be, it may be easier to be grateful when you know, something amazing is going to happen. I mean, guaranteed. If I knew I could feed all of you right now with a little bit of food, I would be super excited about that. But I think also another time is when he actually gave thanks to the Lord and broke bread during the Last Supper. Like, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen to him, but he knew that his body was going to be broken and his blood was going to be poured out. But he still gave thanks to the Lord. 
And there's countless reasons why you and I should be thankful. I think of Psalms 28, an example of the power of being thankful in hard circumstances. Job 121, being thankful in the midst of loss and death he experienced. Hebrews 12, 12 reminds us that we cannot be shaken. 1 Peter 6 and 7 says that thankfulness will get us through our grief in all circumstances. James 1, 7 reminds us that the Lord deserves it. And Ephesians 13, 1, 3, and John 10, 10 says that we have every spiritual blessing and an abundant life. I mean, those are a ton of really good reasons as to for reasons for being thankful. So before we go any further, let's just recap. We'll just recap of what I've shared with you so far in the last five or 10 minutes. We've seen that thank, thankfulness and gratitude is, is good for our, our physical, emotional, and mental well-being. It's actually it's also good for our relationships. It's an encouragement, and it's actually a directive to Scripture. It didn't say you should be thankful in Scripture. It actually tells us to give thanks and to, to, be, to be grateful in Scripture. It's also an encouragement. Jesus modeled it, and he shows us how we want to follow his lead. And it's connected to an abundant life. So I have a question for you to consider. If the data and the facts tell us all these things are true, then why have half of Orange County's population who identify as Christians, that's 1.6 million people in Orange County, why do we not experience and see more gratefulness and gratitude in our daily lives? Honestly, I, I don't know. I have, I, have some, I have some speculations. I have some, some things that I want to share with you. But I believe that the answer to that question of why we don't, why we don't experience gratitude and gratefulness in our daily lives, I believe that the answers are actually in the room. Which reminds me of a story. Um, some of you know this. Before I came on staff here at Mountain View Church uh, about two years ago, a little over two years ago, the prior three decades I worked in the uh, early childhood education field. I, I, I operated uh, child care facilities. And, and we all have our age groups that we love working with. You know, people ask the question of like, you know, what age group do you, when you do an interview, you would ask them like, hey, what age group do you love? And they're like, I love all kids. That's just, that's just not. Yes, we all love kids, but the reality is like, I love that I was there for my toddlers when they were young, but I would not want to work with them every day. So my age group was actually elementary school age, and I would always say there's a special place in heaven for those who work with junior high kids. And so, but, so the company years ago, back in the early 2000s, there was this huge increase in um, the California state school standards for, for kids. And those of your parents, you know, you've experienced this. So the so school became very tough. And so our after-school recreational facilities just weren't doing it for the kids. And so the company and their wisdom developed what's called an academic enrichment program. It was a really strong program that was developmentally appropriate. And they went to go implement it. And after three months, it just wasn't taking off. And, um, and they couldn't figure out why, because it was a super solid program. And so they pulled about 25 of us together and um, from all different kind of positions and stations within the company. Like I, you know, I was oversaw the operations for several centers. They had parents, they had principals in the room, they had teachers, they had all different people. And she pulled us together and she went around the room and said, said your name, your position, how many years you've been in the field. And we went around the room with those 25 people and there was over 700 years of experience in the room. And she said, we have this problem, and she believes, she said, I believe that the answers to the question that I'm asking is actually in the room. And it was a three-hour meeting, and in, in the first hour and a half, we came up with two solutions that we couldn't think of before. And in the next hour and a half, we actually worked on one of those solutions. And the cool part is in the next six months, there was, the company had 140 programs that had school-age programs, and all 140 programs, the... Uh, the programs were, were thriving. The academic enrichment program was actually thriving. So you may, like that's a cool story, but you may be wondering, why do I tell you that story? Well, I asked the question a little bit earlier. I asked the question around, why are we not experiencing more gratitude in our daily lives? And I believe just like that story about the academic enrichment program, I believe actually the answers are in the room. 
Because I'm like, I wonder, I really wanted to do this. I wanted to go around the whole room and maybe like pass a clipboard or something and total it up. But I wonder, like, how many years have you been walking with Jesus? So I've been 1999, so that's 24 years. So let's just do a quick stroll poll. I'm going to ask you, how many years have you been walking with Jesus? And how many years have you been walking with Jesus? Yeah. So think about it. Think about it. 40 years. How about you, Robin? About 40 to 80 years. We'll go back. How about you? 24 years. Okay, so we're already over 100. With three people, with three people, we're already at 105 years of experience. We had mine. We're already at you know, a century and a quarter years of experience. Imagine that number of how many years you've been walking, experience, walking with Jesus. And we also have the eternal one inside of us. You know, he is timeless, obviously. And to think about also, we have the mind of Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul reminds us, that we have the mind of Christ. So we, we can not only know his thoughts, we can have God's thoughts. And so I really want to pose the question to you, of like maybe you can make the question personal. Like, am I experiencing gratitude in my daily life? And if not, why am I not experiencing gratitude in my, in my life? It's such a pic- good picture. I mean, I was hopeful that there was a lot of years in the front row, but man, 120 years <laughs> just out of four people, that's pretty cool. So I just want to pose the question. I want to ask you to kind of lob out some answers. But we're just going to get a few. Actually, I have some that I want to share with you that I, that I believe. But like I said, I believe the answers are in the room. I believe in you. What are some reasons why we don't experience gratitude in our daily lives? It's actually a question. It's not rhetorical. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I didn't frame that well. It's not meant to be rhetorical. Maybe throw out some answers. So comparison is one, so we can compare ourselves with one another, which diminishes our gratitude. Okay, that's solid. Someone, we're used, to it. We're, we're used to it, like maybe there's kind of like a numbness to it, yeah? How about one or two more? We're self-absorbed, we're self-absorbed meaning like we only think about what's best for us, okay? One more time. We're focused on our problems. We can only see what's in front of us, and we can't necessarily see the larger lens. Those are so good. And I'm so thankful I came up with other ones, because I'm going to share with you four, and now you're not only have four, you're going to have seven. Those were all really solid reasons as to why. So I want to share with you just four reasons, and it's really based on, it's based on some scripture that I found to, um, to connect us with this. I think one of the reasons why we don't experience gratitude in our daily lives is that we don't believe what the Lord of hosts says about us. Let me read to you 1 Peter 2.9. It says, but you, he's talking to you, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Just linger in those words. You are beloved. You are royalty. You are priest. That's what scripture says about you because you've chosen to to follow Jesus and accept what he's done for us. If If you're struggling with believing that, that could be something that could be hindering experiencing the fullness of gratitude. Another reason is that you may believe that you're not worthy. You know, we have an enemy, Scripture, and and John 8, 8 says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he tells a lie, he speaks his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. I've been on this earth for for a few years, and man, there's some people who have said some pretty mean stuff to me. You know, in all candor, I've said some unkind things as well. Um, but I think about the things that have been said to me that have really been kind of towards my identity. When I was a kid, there was this phrase that said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is the dumbest statement <laughs> I've ever heard, and it's completely inaccurate. For me, I was pretty active when I was a kid, and before the age of 18, between my two ankles, I actually broke and sprained them a total of seven times. But I can't actually, actually, I cannot remember how it felt. 
I cannot remember how it felt to break. I know it was painful. I mean, I was losing casts, on crutches, you know, the whole deal. But I remember some of, the, some of the mean things that were actually said to me when I was growing up. So we can actually receive some things from the father of lies. I'm not saying the people who said these things to me were my enemy, but they said some things and then I, I held on to it. And that actually became a hindrance for, for me personally to, to experience gratitude in, in my daily life. Another reason is sometimes we're, we're carrying things that we're not designed to carry. In Matthew, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And Jesus goes on to say, for my yoke is comfortable, another translation is easy, and my burden is light. It's hard to be grateful when we're in pain, when we're experiencing pain. And actually, I have a friend here today, a new friend. Her name is Trisha, and she has a story that's going to kind of underscore this. So would you give a warm welcome for Trisha? Hey, Tricia. Hey there, Marty. I'm doing good. All right. Well, let's jump in. Okay. I'm excited because I've lobbed a couple of questions to her, but I have no idea what the answers are going to be, so I'm excited <laughs> to hear what she has to say. Bye. All right. So, Tricia, something had happened a few weeks back that uh, caused you to reach out, for, out to Brandon for, for prayer, and then you came in and some of us prayed for you. So would you mind sharing what, what, what's sure. that? thing was that caused you to come in? So a couple of weeks ago, I did a self-examination, and I found a very large lump. And I have a few friends here that have been through that, and I, it was absolutely terrifying. Not as terrifying as sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, I love it. my mind just went absolutely every, everywhere. It was just devastating. So I called, immediately I called my primary care physician and he got me in right away. And his words were kind of, wow, I feel that too. Mm. So we're gonna have to send you for a mammogram and an ultrasound and we'll carry it on, we'll see what, what comes of that. So when Brandon invited me to come here for prayer, Marty and Gina and Juliana were here and just, and my husband Mike, of course. We came here and you all prayed for me like I have never felt before. It was the Mm. most beautiful, comforting, wonderful prayer about healing of my body. I just can't even explain how new friends, new people in my life Mm. touched me the way that you did. Mm. Yeah, so good. And then Marty said to me, Trish, do you have a sin of fear that you need to confess. And for just a second, I thought, what the heck kind of question is that? (laughs) Because all of my fear was, I ain't got time for this. I don't want to lose my hair. I don't have much tolerance for pain. But the thing that came out was, I don't want to die because my children and grandchildren don't know the Lord. Mm. It was, it just, it came out and I was, actually surprised and shocked that that's what you're carrying that Kate well, I was carrying I did not know that I was carrying that burden of course I've always prayed for them always every day it's been my pretty much my only prayer because I know what our lives have changed mm-hmm. knowing him and knowing about eternity so our prayer time together completely changed from this silly little lump that I have to this giant burden that I have been carrying since I've known the Lord. Yeah, and in that time you, you chose to, to hand that, that burden to, to Jesus, right? You helped me through that, all three of you have helped me through that during that day. I can't, I can't even tell you, I was, as you know, 
me. I was sobbing here on that poor couch, and mm. you're, you were soaking wet from all of my tears. I mean, it was just, it was just a, an emotional day. Yeah, yeah. But when I walked out of here, on our way to the mammogram, I was not so much, I was just, conf I was actually confused because I didn't know I was, had this giant burden. Yeah, so before I ask you the next question, so that came up and I, I just got this sense that you were carrying something, so we asked that and, and then you chose in that moment, like, hey, I, wanna, I wanna hand my children over to you, Jesus, I trust you. And so you handed these burdens over to him. I did. Right, and then you walked I out did. feeling. I walked out feeling lighter. And much, exhausted. Much lighter, yet exhausted. Exhausted and lighter and confused on what does that look like. Right, right. I mean, I've read that verse every single day, and I always think, oh, Debbie needs this. <laughs> Susan really could use this <laughs> verse. You know what? There's Kathy and Dan sitting there. They, they need to know that they are right. burdened, and they don't even know it, and they need this verse. Not me. <laughs> I'm good. I am good. It's, it's been my life verse, and not once in all those years that I was praying that, did I ever think about me yeah. and my burden? So Jesus reminded you in that time. But, that but he, cer he certainly did. I mean, I know I'm going to yeah. need follow-up and some work on that because, you know, it, I'm Italian, so we carry a lot of guilt. Okay. So okay. it was just okay. to let that go like We'll break that agreement later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let's, um, let's jump in just for the sake of time. I'm mean, love we'll just actually do a half an hour interview with Trisha. This would be amazing. Um, but the, so you, you left, you and Mike left, and so you Mike went and to your So Mike and I planet. left, and we went to the, to the breast clinic, and they called me back, and they did the mammogram, and then I had to go sit for a little while, and then they brought me in for the ultrasound. And I could tell the technician was rrr, rrr, like, rrr, rrr, rrr. And she says, just a minute, I'm going to call the radiologist in here, the doctor. So the doctor came in and asked me what was going on, and er, 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 er. she <laughs> said, do you mind showing us exactly where that was? And when was the last time you felt, well, this morning in the shower, I'll show you exactly where it was. And I felt myself, and I busted out laughing because it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> it was gone. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, now I'm ugly snot sobbing, <laughs> ugly. And I was laughing and I was crying at the same time and I just kept saying, only you could do that. Only the Lord could do that. It was there that morning. It was, go it was completely gone. And I shared that with the technicians and they were like, whatever it was, it's not there now. Yes, that's so, so I'm good. good. I am yeah, good. Praise Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. I mean, come on, how do you not get excited about that? I, oh. I almost dropped the mic, but it's like a $600 mic, so that'd be a bad idea. That'd be bad, kidding, Jeff. So yeah, I mean, that is what, we didn't have time for Trisha to share. Trisha actually shared a little later that she believed that, she didn't believe the Lord gave her the cancer, but she believed the Lord encouraged her to come and to reach out for prayer. So this burden that she was carrying that could be lifted. And we think about what Dar Caroline Leaf's statement a little bit earlier talked about, that we have, the, we have this agency, we can change our brains. And I just wonder, it continues to make me wonder about this topic of capturing our thoughts. But I did say there was four, so let me just give you the fourth one, and then we're going we're gonna to start landing the plane. The fourth one is that we don't believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and well, and that maybe he stopped speaking when the Bible was written, or maybe he's not speaking to me. In Hebrew 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know, sometimes based on the prior wounds that we have, like the first couple things that I had shared, those can be a reason of why we're not experiencing gratitude. And, and it could be like, he doesn't speak to me. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak to me. But I love the scripture because the word of God is living and active 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we know we have scripture, but it's meant to point to Jesus. It's meant to point to God. It's meant to point to the Holy Spirit. So I told you we were going to start landing this plane. Why would I spend so much time on gratitude? But one, because I believe that you deserve to experience the joy that he has for you. I mean, think of Trisha's joy that she's experiencing right now. I believe that's available for you as well. But I also believe because my heart, Mountain View Church's heart, is that you fully understand that being grateful can actually change lives. Not just yours, but others. We're actually called to be a light of the world. And being grateful is not only good for me, but it's connected to what Jesus is calling us to. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, he says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I want to give you a visual of actually of what this is saying. Jeff, could you dim the lights for us? Sorry, cameraman, you got to track me all over here. You know, we're still on this side of the cross. We still live in a fallen world. There is darkness. And Jesus wants us to bring heaven to earth. And he made it possible by putting heaven in you. Like he put his light in you. And I believe that when we trust when we trust in that and we're actually grateful for it, we take the basket off. It's a metaphor, obviously. And it reveals his light. The darkness cannot overcome it. I've actually heard the phrase before that says that uh, they, someone told me that they believe that the, the world is actually getting darker and darker. But that's only possible if we don't let our light shine. Because John 1.5 says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You remember a recent sermon from Brandon when he, what he says about uh, the Holy Spirit? This was actually, I was going to show a clip, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to show it. I love this quote from him. He actually said, I am not only saved by God, but I'm also sent by God. I'm not only saved by God, but I'm also sent by God. This will only be true if we, if we live in love out of this posture of gratitude. So what? Now what? What do you do with all of that? Logic and reasoning isn't going to change the world because with all the data that you already know, like none of this information, the scripture is not new to you. I know that's not. It, actually, the logic and reasoning isn't going to move the needle, but only Jesus will. Only the Holy Spirit can. And he wants to partner with us within this. So, I'd like to invite the worship team back up. And we're going to... Uh, we have this time coming up when we receive communion and there's just what we call a time of response. I was telling somebody the other day, like, what's a time of response? I'm like, well, you're responding to the message. And they're like, what does, that, what does that really mean? Well, what we talked about, what the Lord stirred within you during this time, we want to create this space for you to be able to respond um, to, to what you heard and what the Lord is stirring within you. So I have uh, uh, three questions I would love for you to just spend some time and linger with Jesus on. And they're up on the screen. We're going to leave them up just for a little bit. And then we're going to enter into some communion. Not some communion. We're going to enter into communion. So the three questions are, 
Is there something that's hindering my gratitude? If you find yourself in this place of like not struggling with experience and gratitude, just asking Jesus, trusting that the answers are in the room, that it's in you because he is in you and you have the mind of Christ. Answering the question from that posture of like, I know that the answer is in me. So this question of, is there something that's hindering my gratitude? The next question is, how can I express my gratitude differently to the world? So if you're not someone who's hindered in your gratitude and you want to express it more, kind of that part two, it's not just for me, it's for other. How can I express that? And finally, the last question is, what is Jesus calling me to? Not just on the topic of gratitude, but how do I use the gift that he has given me for the kingdom? How do I bring heaven and earth? How do I let that light shine to light up the world around me? So we're going to have some time of response. I also want to invite the servers forward for communion. So when you're ready, just a reminder of what the bread represents. The bread represents is Jesus' body that he actually gave thanks for before he broke it. And he told his friends that he was going to, his body was going to be broken. And then the, the juice, the wine, represents the wine that was supposed to represent his blood that was poured out on the cross. So please, I ask you, I implore you to spend some time and linger with the Lord on this, on these three questions. And when you're ready, come receive communion.